Y'all may be seated. There again, uh, thank y'all for having me this morning. Uh, I know for some of you it's a surprise. Uh, I thank Dad, Pastor Clark, for asking me asking me to come fill in for him. It's a, it is both an honor and a privilege, uh, and everything else that comes with that, <laughs> as far as that goes. Uh, this morning we're going to be bouncing around Scripture a fair amount because. I almost had too much time to prepare um, as, as, far, as far as that goes. My, the main passage we're going to be reading from today is in Mark 12, uh, verses 29 through 31. So if y'all want to pull those up, we'll land there eventually, um, <laughs> you're, as far as that goes. Um, I, I warned Dad that, that the illustration I had this morning was a little unorthodox. But hopefully most, most of you have seen the film Rocky III. Because that's where I'm going. Uh, <laughs> the, the, the reason, uh, it's a film that came out in 1982 with Sylvester Stallone about a boxer. A uh, boxer that in the previous films was down on his luck, had, had fought, become the world champion, and since then gotten comfortable, gotten complacent, gotten, you know, spoiled a little bit in the luxury life. Gotten spoiled in, in, in who he was and what he was in that, and, and it was unsettling to him a little bit, but hey, when, you, when you're driving a Ferrari and wearing a leather coat, it's easy to get comfortable. So the reason I'm using this illustration is, is because especially in the, here in the United States, we become comfortable with the idea that as Americans, we're obviously Christians, right? But it's the same thing. Being American means you are a Christian, right? At least used to be synonymous. But is that always true? Is being a patriot mean you're in the kingdom? Are they the same thing? What are the grand, the, the grand foundational things of, of being a Christian? Well, they actually have nothing to do with country of origin. They have, they have nothing to do with where you're born or where you're raised. It's whether or not you put your faith in Jesus Christ. And hopefully, if you have placed that faith in Jesus Christ, then you know what Jesus said was the greatest of all commandments is to know the Lord your God and to love him. And we're going to, I'm actually going to read that verse here in Mark 12 real quick. And it's when, and Jesus has been challenged here by the, by the Pharisees and all, and they, they've kind of cornered him and they, they want to know, okay, well, what's the, what's the greatest commandment? What's, what in your opinion, uh, opinion teacher is, is the pinnacle of all the commandments of scripture. And in Mark 12, 29, Jesus answered. The first and principal one of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And you shall love the Lord your God out of, out of and with your whole heart and with your whole soul, your life, and out and in with your whole mind. That's your faculty of thought and your moral understanding. And with your strength, that is the first and principal commandment. So why did I bring up patriotism? So why did I bring up Rocky? Well, you see, are we loyal to our first love? As Christians, our first love should be Christ. And the God he is, and the son of the God, Yahweh, Elohim, Jehovah Jireh, pick a name, the great I am, as he identifies himself repeatedly in scripture. If we love God first, and we love God completely with our strength, with our mind, with our soul, with our life, then we walk around praising him. You may have seen the image I put out online with people raising their hands in praise, but in the background, and as we've seen all across our news, in front of flaming cities, is a fist. Now, I'm not saying that there's not a just cause behind the fist. I'm not saying that those that oppose it are not just. What I'm saying is that if we are reaching out to God, we can't be reaching out in hate. We can't be reaching out in anger. We cannot be reaching out in distrust of one another because here in Mark 12 Jesus didn't just stop at the first great commandment 
He continued and said, The second is like it, and that you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. See, Jesus took the time, as Mark tells us, not to just say, you should love God. You should love my Father. You should love, you should love the creator of all things, the founder of the universe. But he also said you should love his prized creation. You should love your neighbor. Okay, that seems pretty easy, right? My neighbor you know, helps me with the lawn sometimes. Lends me a tool when I need it. Even a cup of sugar. Got a great recipe from my neighbor. Easy to love my neighbor. Okay, well, what about if your neighbor looks different than you? What about if your neighbor prays different? What about if your neighbor was born in a different country? What about if your neighbor lets his dog poop in your yard? What about if your neighbor steals your newspaper every morning? What about if your neighbor never takes care of anything in their own yard? What about if your neighbor has loud kids? I got one at home. He makes as much noise as possible. He does not have an inside voice. <laughs> Promise you that. What about if your neighbor, I don't know, ran over your mailbox? You still love him? What about if your neighbor votes differently than you and is proud about how they vote? What about if they put out all the election signs for the opponent you do not like in their yard? You still love them? Do you still care about them? Do you still express that love to them in Christ? We're supposed to. Because, see, when, when Christ talks about love, he doesn't see race. He doesn't see color. He doesn't see history. He sees a human being. He sees a human being that he was willing to give up his life for. God sent him his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. See, there is only one way, but that way is for all that believe. We talk about the broad path and the easy path and the mob path and all those things. Those don't lead to heaven. The path to heaven is love. And... I'm not here to talk politics. I, I really am not. I mean, it may feel that way to some. But what I want to talk about is the fact that love is not me and mine and them and theirs. Love is God's. Because we're all God's children. We were all created in his image. No matter what that image looks like as portrayed by me or my neighbor or the 10, 20,000 people around us that aren't in church today. They're all God's children, whether they want to acknowledge it or not. God loves all of us. Peter said, I'm reading here out of Acts 10, 34 and 35. I'm going to be reading out of the Passion Translator, Translation. The Passion starts with, Peter said, Now I know for certain that God does not show favoritism with people, but treats everyone on the same basis. It, is, it makes no difference what race of a people one belongs to if they show deep reverence for God and are committed to doing what's right, they are acceptable before him. Deep reverence for God. See, when, when God is, is giving out blessings and when God is forgiving people and putting people in the land's book of life, belief and faith are all that matters. That's it. How much money are in your bank account? How many cars are in your driveway? How big your house is? How much dog? How hard you work? Doesn't matter. Faith and belief in the risen Son of God as the Messiah is the only thing that matters and God didn't put any other limitations on it than that. He said, here's my son in whom I am well pleased. That's the guy you got to believe in. He is the path. He is the narrow road. Okay. So as the church, if 
We are Christians. And we are openly saying, I'm a Christian. I believe in the way. The one way is the, uh, you know, a lot of times you'll see the, 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 the symbol that came out in the 70s and the 60s where people would do the one way and it's, it's making a reemergence amongst a lot. I'm a Christian. I stand here as one who has been redeemed in love by the one way. Everything I do is a reflection of him because I bear his name, right? Or is everything I do a reflection of that flag? You gotta pick one. Or, by honoring this one, do I naturally honor that one? Now, for those of you that can't see it, there's a Christian flag on my left and there is an American flag on my right. In Hebrews 11, there is a list of all the people of faith and all the great people of, of the Old Testament, Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Sarah, Moses, Samson, Samuel, David, and several others listed. And what Hebrews says about that is that the heroes all died still clinging to their faith, not even receiving all that had been promised them, but they saw beyond the horizon to the fulfillment of the promises and gladly embraced it from afar. They all lived their lives on earth as those who belong to another realm. For clearly those who live this way are longing for the appearing of a heavenly city. And if their hearts were still remembering what they had left, well, they'd find an opportunity to go back to it. But they couldn't turn back for their hearts were fixed on what was far greater that is the heavenly realm. So because of this, God is not ashamed in any way to be called their God. For he has prepared a heavenly city for them. <laughs> Can we all say that? That God is not ashamed in any way to be called our God? Are our actions reflecting the kingdom in all we do? What have we made our priority? Have we made our priority the riches of the world and the, the, the rat race, as it were? Have we gotten complacent and comfortable in whatever version of success this world has to offer? Because if we do, and if we have, well, I'm going to read another verse here. Out of 1 Peter 5, 8. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. gotten comfortable standing in the, in, the, in the fruit trees and amongst the abundance and careless and we're not, we're not standing for what we're supposed to believe in if we're not vigilant. Because of course that, that 1 Peter 5.8 starts off by saying be alert and be sober minded. If we're not standing in the kingdom if we're not honoring God, if God has reason to be ashamed. The devil's just waiting. The Bible teaches us that the devil does not have power unless power is ceded to him. As the believing body, we are we we have received the received the blessing of the Spirit. We've got a lot of power in our tongue. We've got a lot of power in what we do and say. And if we've gotten comfortable and complacent. Because of where we were born or what, how our life is or how free we are. We've gotten too complacent in our freedom that we're not concerned about what the kingdom says. And what the kingdom would have us to be. 
If God has reason to be ashamed, well, the devil's just like, you know, you look kind of tasty. That's a, that, that right there is something I can chew on, you know. The, uh, to go back to my, to my rocky analogy, because why not? The last known survivor stalks his prey in the night. He is watching us all with the eye of the tiger for the thrill of the fight. That's literally the lyrics to the theme song to Rocky III. But as Christians, we should take that to heart because that lion, that tiger, that devil loves the fight. He's already lost. Now the Bible tells us he's already been defeated. He was defeated when Christ defeated death and rose from the dead. But he loves the fight. He loves the prey. He loves the hunt. Well, if you're not on guard, if you're not vigilant, if you're not standing in the kingdom, if you're not making sure that you're not giving God to be something ashamed of, if you're standing in the kingdom and doing the kingdom's work and standing as a beacon of that love that God calls us to be as an as a ambassador of the way, you're easy prey. Because if you're not standing in the kingdom, and if you're not standing with and in the spirit and in the word of God, and you've not made your, your tongue sharper than a two-edged sword with the scripture, not with the profanity or the ways of the world or the Declaration of Independence or the Constitution. Because when the devil comes, they ain't going to save you. I'm an American. I'm proud to be an American. I have men in every generation of my family who have fought for this country and many that have died and laid down their lives for this country. So I am proud to be an American, but I am more proud to be a son of God and a brother to the risen Savior in whom I receive that inheritance. Mm -hmm. To be part of a kingdom that is not of this world, that does not have corrupt people running it, does not have fallible men in charge of it. We've got to remember who we are in the kingdom. We've got to remember who we are as children of God. See, when we become Christians, we're saying that I am a child of God. I am stand here today and I tell you that the lion, the tiger, and the bear, oh my, have no power over me and my family because we are born again Christians believing in the risen Savior and the word of God that was passed down through the generation and his infallible word. I stand on it. Now am I perfect? No. Some would say I'm covered in sin. That my sin is visible because of the ink in my body. But I promise you this, my name is in the Lamb's Book of Life. I have no doubt of that. When my, when my family get, gets absent from me for too long or it gets too quiet around the house, you know what the first thought that pops in my mind is? I miss the rapture. It's the first thought. It's not, oh, someone's come in and burglarized my family or the devil's taken someone or there's a witch Casting incantations and making dis people disappear. No. The first thought in my mind, because I know and I am secure in my faith at the position and the health and the testimony of my family. The first thought in my mind is, they done gone home without me. They've been called up and I did something. I was wrong. It's not because I doubt my own faith. It's because I know their testimony. It's because I know in whom they have believed. Now I know this, uh, all these verses may seem just like I tossed, tossed the Bible against the wall and, and, and ended up where I ended up. Forgive me, I didn't mean to drop that that hard. But we live in a time right now where everywhere I turn, I read a newspaper, I see the news, I read an article, I, I click on a, 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 something online and it's telling me, that I should hate my neighbor. It's telling me that I should believe my government. It's telling me I should hate my government. It's telling me that, that it's black and white, or it's this race versus that race, or it's these people are trying to destroy my heritage, or these people are trying to loot my business. 
But you know what God says? I should love them. Look, I should love all of them. I should love the honest politician, if there is such a thing. I should uh, love the crooked politician. I should love the rioters and looters. I should love the honest protesters that are just trying to be heard. I should love the civic leaders that are inciting people. I should love the people that are just going to work every day and don't have time for this, any of the political foolishness. I should love the people that are hating other people. Do I agree with their hate? Absolutely not, because I'm a child of God and I love them. And I'm called to love everybody. I should love the people in my own family that have wronged others. Because he first loved me. I urge you, brothers and sisters, for the sake of the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to agree to live in unity with one another. To the put to rest any division that attempts to tear you apart. Be restored as one united body living in perfect harmony. For a consistent choreography among yourselves. Having a common perspective and shared values. That's 1 Corinthians 1.10. If you want to look it up. And I read it out of the passage translation. Paul writing to the church in Corinth in the first century. Paul writing to the church in Corinth in the first century. A man who killed Christians, hunted them. That God said that it's going to be an ambassador of love. <laughs> Most of you, everyone I'm talking to here today, is, you've never hunted your neighbor and tried to try to kill your neighbor. To my knowledge, I know we've all been frustrated. But if Paul can be an ambassador of love, if he can be so transformed by the kingdom that he can put himself in harm's way. Not only with the, the Pharisees and Sadducees and rabbis and all of the, the Hebrew kingdom, but also in Rome and everywhere else. If he can set aside the wealth that he had, because, let's face it, because of his position, he probably was a fairly wealthy man. If he can say love, unity, the way. Because it's for the sake of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I urge you, my brothers and sisters, for the sake of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, to agree to live in unity with one another. Put to rest any division. Because it doesn't have a place in the kingdom. And if the church would stand united and not factionalized, the church of Jesus Christ, anybody, anybody in the face of this planet that says, I am a Christian, I serve the way, would stand up and say, it's time to kick the kitty to the curb, that the lion has no power in our village, that the politics of my nation will never supersede my role in the kingdom's work. Then all these people walking in the streets wouldn't be talking about their political agendas. They'd be talking about the risen Savior. All around the world, these masses of people would be singing glory to God in the highest peace on earth to all men. Now we know because of prophetic scripture that that won't happen until after this is all destroyed. But the church needs to remember that. That at the end of it all, when God comes back and Christ is seated here on the face of the earth, 
All the things that we love, all the monuments to men, they'll already been destroyed. So let's love people and stop worrying about buildings. I'm not saying it's right to destroy property. What I'm saying is it's right to love your neighbor in the name of Jesus Christ and according to his work in the kingdom. Stephanie, if you want to come on up, we're going we're gonna to sing, uh, sing a song here for a second before we go to the offering time. And when I, I named this, I titled this service Rising Up. Why? Because I think it's time for the church to rise up and say, no more, in the, no more. We're not going to, all life is sacred because I've been told I have to love my neighbor and I have to have a neighbor to love. Because it's the second greatest commandment. I have a God to love. I have that secured in my heart. I've got to have a neighbor to love. So all life is sacred. Love is the order of the kingdom, not division. We must be unified in the purpose in the church that we are going to love everyone. Love all those that we come in contact with. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're going to sing a hymn uh, 432, "Revive Us, O Lord," because there needs to be a, 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 a reviving in the church. There needs to be a banner lifted high over every Christian that goes out into the world that says, "I love you." I love you. I think part of our problem is for several months now the government's saying, "Don't even shake hands with one another. Don't hug one another." And I understand the reasons for it, and I understand that there are medical things. But you know what? If you're standing in the love of Jesus Christ, you're protected. I'm not saying you won't get sick, but I'm saying, what's the worst that can happen? If you're a believer in the, world, in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you get sick, and I know one needs to get sick, and I don't wish that on anyone, but what's the worst that can happen? You, got, you die and go home? You get your eternal reward? I'm going to show love to my neighbor. Mm -hmm.